All right, uh, thank you for the introduction, Michal. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. Today, I would like to talk about my recent work about uh, joint pricing and inventory management with the strategic customers. This is the joint work with Kangxi from the University of Michigan. So our work is motivated by IKEA. You know that IKEA is the world's uh, leading furniture retailer, right? So IKEA needs to make the following types of decisions in practice, right? So the first, on the demand side, IKEA needs to make the dynamic pricing decisions for each furniture that it sells to customers. And second, IKEA needs to specify when to make the delivery to those customers, and the delayed delivery could be allowed, right? And on the supply side, IKEA also needs to make the inventory decisions. And for the customers, we also observed that, so they could anticipate that sometimes IKEA could run deep promotions for some furniture. Therefore, they could be forward-looking. They should try to adjust their purchasing times, okay? Therefore, given these features, we are motivated to look at the following research question. So we want to understand that in the market where customers are forward-looking, so what kind of the joint pricing, delivery, and inventory policy allows the company to maximize the long-run average expected profit? To answer this question, first let me talk about our model. So we consider the following setup, in which we assume that there is a monopolist seller who sells a single product over the continuous and limited selling horizon. For the seller, at each point of time t, we assume that she needs to make the following decisions. On the demand side, the seller needs to determine the set of the purchase options that she offers to our customers. Wherein every purchase option consists of the retail price that the seller charges every customer and the promised product delivery time. On the supply side, the seller needs to determine the order quantity from the supplier, okay? So uh, without loss of generality, we assume that the lead time is equal to zero. For customers, we make the following assumptions. We assume that customers arrive according to a Poisson process. Every customer considers to purchase at most of one unit of the product, and customers have heterogeneous product valuations, and we assume customers to be forward-looking. So on the next slide, let me talk about how we model customers' forward-looking behavior. We assume that every customer has a type, which is her private information that cannot be observed by anyone else. To be specific for each customer fee, we assume that she's endowed with the following attributes. The first one is denoted by T sub fee, which refers to a customer fee's arrival time. The second one is denoted by V sub fee, which refers to the customer's product valuation. We allow these two attributes to be heterogeneous for different customers. So we make the following assumptions on these attributes. First, we assume that they are uncorrelated. Second, we assume that the hazard rate is not decreasing in V. So we know these are pretty standard assumptions in the literature. Next, let me talk about the decisions on each customer, which is denoted by Z sub V. So now let me explain to you what each component in Z sub V really means. So first, recall that we assume every customer to be forward-looking. So at each point of time, the customer needs to decide whether she would like to stop monitoring price dynamics and immediately make the purchasing decision, or she would like to delay to make the purchasing decision and continue to stay in the system. So it's notation tau sub V to denote the time that customer fee decides to stop monitoring price dynamics and make the purchasing decision. At this point of time, with notation A sub V to denote the number of product that customer fee purchases. And we use notation omega sub V to denote the purchase option that customer fee selects, okay? All right, next let me talk about the customer's utility function. It is equal to the product valuation that customer fee garners by making the purchasing decision minus the price that she pays to the seller, minus the delayed utility that she incurs from staying in the system by both actively monitoring price dynamics and passively waiting for the product delivery, which is captured by the last term in this equation, okay? So here we use the function capital W of V to denote the customer's delayed utility per unit of time. We make the following assumptions on this delayed utility rate function. So the first assumption entails that a customer actually suffers from waiting, right? The second assumption entails that a customer with a higher product valuation would incur more delayed utility. The third and the last assumptions entail that when the customer's product valuation increases, so although we allow the customer's delayed utility to also increase, but it cannot increase too fast. Actually, many frequently use the delayed utility rate functions satisfy these conditions. Uh, so for instance, this includes the constant delayed utility rate function, the alpha function, as well as some power function, where the power is between zero and one, okay? Uh, so next, let me talk about the seller's cost structure. When the seller places a order, she incurs the, even, uh, the, the fixed ordering cost. When the seller keeps inventory on hand, she incurs the even, uh, inventory holding cost, okay? Uh, next, let me talk about the sequence of events. 
so the, the seller and customers are playing a stack over game. In the first stage of the game, before the start of the season, the seller needs to determine, announce to public, and commit to public which policy she will implement over the course of the season. To be precise, at time zero, the seller needs to determine the set of all inventory replenishment times over the entire season. Over the course of the season, at each point of time, when the seller makes the inventory decision and purchase option decision, the information available to her consists of her historic decisions and the historic sales. And here, the feasibility condition requires the seller to always have no negative on hand inventory. In the second stage of the game, so over the course of the season, every customer needs to decide the best response stopping time and the purchasing decision. When a customer makes the decision, the information available to her consists of the seller's historic decisions on the purchase options, okay? So in this game, what the seller needs to do is to find the joint pricing, delivery, and inventory policy at time zero to maximize her long run average expected profit, okay? Uh, so there are several streams of literature related to the present work. For instance, there are some papers that study the joint pricing and inventory management. There are some papers that study the dynamic pricing with strategic customers. And also there are some literature that use the dynamic mechanism design approach into the operations management context. So uh, what this talk is about? Well, uh, perhaps you have seen that actually this problem is extremely complicated. Because we have dynamics, we have stochasticity in the system, and customers are forward-looking. So it's hopeless to find after the policy. So what we have to do is to come up with a good heuristic policy. So in the rest of the talk, uh, here are the things that I would like to do, okay? So first, I would like to come up with a good benchmark profit that would serve as the upper bound of the seller's out-feasible joint pricing, delivery, and inventory policies. Second, I will use this upper bound to come up with the heuristic policy and analyze its performance. So first, let me talk about this upper bound. So we have the following result. We can show that the seller's profit under every feasible joint pricing, delivery, and inventory policy is upper bounded by her optimal profit in the following dynamic mechanism design problem. So I will not go into the details of this dynamic mechanism design problem, but let me highlight the key features of this problem, okay? So first, recall that in our original pricing problem, we assumed that every customer's type is two-dimensional. However, we noticed that, so the reason I'm introducing this mechanism design problem is to only to use this to help us to establish a tractable upper bound, right? Therefore, to make the analysis um, the easier, then in this upper bound problem, we assume that the seller is able to observe every customer's arrival time. Therefore, this problem only has the one-dimensional IC constraint, okay? The second feature here is, so unlike the typical mechanism design problem, wherein the seller only needs to make the decisions for customers, but here, the seller also needs to take into account the decisions on the supply side. So the seller needs to figure out how to make the inventory replenishment decisions, okay? All right, so for this mechanism design problem, after applying the Marisonian approach and uh, uh, together with some other algebra, then we can establish the following upper bound. So now let me explain to you what this upper bound means, okay? So first, this upper bound is a view optimization problem without having the IC constraint, okay? And for this problem, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, sorry about that. So for this problem, at time zero, the seller needs to determine the set of all inventory replenishment times over the entire season, right? And over the course of the season, we assume that the seller is able to observe every customer's type. So the seller needs to make the allocative decision for each customer, okay? So if the seller decides to sell the product to a customer, then the profit the seller could garner from this customer is captured by this right term, okay? So this right term has three components. The first one is defined as the virtual value. The second one is essentially the inventory holding cost. The third one is defined as the virtual delay cost function, okay? Uh, so the seller makes the following allocative rules on each customer. So first, the seller never considers to sell to those customers whose valuations are below the threshold valuation, which is denoted by V star. Here we define V star to be the root of the virtual value equation, okay? And for other customers whose valuations are above the threshold valuation, then the seller makes the following policy. So suppose the seller decides to sell the product to this customer, then the revenue the seller could collect from this customer is equal to this virtual value, right? And there are two ways to satisfy this customer's demand. One is to use the existing inventory that is replenished at the latest time, latest inventory replenishment time to meet the customer's today's demand. So if the seller exercises this demand fulfillment option, then the cost that the seller incurs is the inventory holding cost, which is captured by the second term here. 
Alternatively, the seller may allow the demand to be backlogged and ask the, the, the demand to be satisfied in the beginning of the next inventory replenishment time. If the seller exercises this demand fulfillment option, then the cost that she incurs is captured by the last term here, which is called um, the demand backlogging cost. So basically, a seller needs to choose the demand fulfillment option that will result in the lower cost, okay? All right. So I mean, on the family of all the inventory replenishment time schedules, it's very easy to show that the optimum one should have the constant inventory replenishment time, which is captured by the blue term here, okay? And for the notation of uh, clarity, here we use notation J sub L to denote the seller's expected profit per unit of time under the policy wherein the inventory replenishment time is equal to capital L, okay? So in the rest of the talk, what we have to do is to figure out how to compute J sub L, right? To do so, we find it to be very important to understand how to compute every customer's virtual profit function, which is the right function here, okay? So here you can see that there are three terms, therefore it will be very important to figure out the order relations of the three terms, right? So to do so, we find it to be very useful to define the following three time-dependent threshold value functions. The first one is defined as V sub H sub T. At this valuation, the customer's virtual value is equal to the inventory holding cost. The second one is defined as V sub theta sub T. At this valuation, the customer's virtual value is equal to the virtual delay cost. The third one is defined as V to the sub T. At this valuation, the customer's inventory holding cost is the same as the virtual delay cost. So the following the, the figure illustrates the dynamics of these three uh, threshold uh, functions, okay? So first, let's look at the, the blue curve, which corresponds to the first threshold valuation. So if the customer's type is above this blue curve, then we know that this customer's virtual value is higher than the inventory holding cost. Otherwise, if the customer's type is below this blue curve, then the customer's virtual value is less than the inventory holding cost. Next, let's look at the right curve here. So this one corresponds to the second threshold valuation. So again, if the customer's virtual the type is above this red curve, then the customer's virtual value is higher than the virtual delay cost. Otherwise, the customer's virtual value is lower than the virtual delay cost. Third, let's look at the green curve here, which corresponds to the third threshold valuation, V tilde. So if the customer's type is above this green curve, then we know that the customer's even their holding cost is cheaper than the virtual delay cost. If the customer's type is below the green curve, then we know that the customer's uh, even their holding cost is higher than the virtual delay cost, okay? Uh, so we can also make the, another observation. So here we may notice that there exists a cut of time denoted by T lower bar. At this point of time, three curves intersect. There also exists the second uh, the cut of time denoted by T upper bar. Starting from this point of time, the green curve hits the upper bound uh, of the, um, the customer's valuation, okay? So by using these properties, now we are able to compute every customer's virtual profit function, okay? So uh, here uh, in this figure, I actually divide the plane into three areas, and I mark them into different colors, okay? So first, let's look at the customer whose type is in the dark gray area. So if the customer's type is here in this dark gray area, then we can see that this customer's virtual value is higher than the inventory holding cost, and the inventory holding cost is cheaper than the virtual delay cost. Therefore, for this group of customers, their virtual product function is equal to their virtual value minus the inventory holding cost. Next, let's look at those customers whose type is in the, the light gray area is here. Actually, it seems there's no big difference between the light gray and the white area. Anyway, this is the light gray area, okay? So if the customer's type lies here, then we know that the customer's virtual value is greater than the customer's virtual delay cost, and the customer's virtual delay cost is cheaper than the inventory holding cost. Therefore, for customers who are here, then their virtual product function is equal to their virtual value minus the virtual delay cost. Third, let's look at those customers who are in this white area. Then we know that, so for these customers, their virtual value is less than both the inventory holding cost and the virtual delay cost. Therefore, their virtual profit function is equal to zero, okay? So after characterizing every customer's virtual profit function as specified here by this equation, now we are able to get a code form solution of this upper bound profit function, J sub L, it disappeared anyway, okay? Uh, but this is not the end of talking about the benchmark profit. It's because, you know, so we should also use this benchmark to help us to propose a good heuristic policy. Therefore, next I would like to give it a strong managerial interpretation, okay? So this is what we know from mechanism design literature. 
So typically, the seller's optimal profit or the upper bound of the optimal profit could be interpreted as the profit that a seller could garner uh, under some anonymous posted price policy, right? So next, I would like to do it in a similar way. So I would like to show that this is also the optimal profit in uh, some settings wherein the seller uh, implements some anonymous posted pricing policy. So let's look at the following anonymous posted pricing policy. Okay, so this is the cyclic policy wherein the seller repeats the same decisions over cycles with the constant cycle length denoted by capital L. And in the beginning of the cycle, the seller makes the inventory replenishment decision, okay? And on the demand side, so the seller implements the following purchase options, which is anonymous um, posted purchase options. Without lots of generality, let's focus on the first cycle, starting from time zero up to time capital L, okay? So now we divide the entire cycle into three different phases. So now let's look at the first phase that starts from time zero up to time t lower bar. In this phase, the seller essentially offers customers the uh, single purchase option with the instantaneous product delivery guarantee, okay? And the price that the seller charges customers is set to be the, the V sub H, okay? So following on this rule, then we can easily see that if the customer's product valuation is equal to this blue term, then this customer is different between choosing this purchase option and not buying anything. Okay, next let's look at the second phase, which starts from the first cut of time T lower bar to the second cut of time T upper bar. Uh, so in this uh, phase, the seller offers customers two purchase options, where one purchase option guarantees the instantaneous product delivery at the price P sub H, and the other one actually allows for the delayed product delivery at the price P sub theta. So for the delayed delivery option, then the seller promises to customers to make the delivery in the beginning of the next cycle, which is at time capital L, okay? So the definitions of these two prices are the specified as follows. So from their definitions, we can easily see that if a customer's valuation is equal to the right one, then this customer is different between choosing the delayed purchase option, delayed delivery option, and not buying anything. If the customer's valuation is equal to the green one, then we can see that this customer is different between choosing the delayed delivery option and um, the instantaneous delivery option, okay? Uh, next, let's look at the third phase that starts from the, the cut of time T upper bar to the end of the cycle. So in this phase, then the seller again offers the customers the single purchase option with the delayed delivery, wherein the product will be delayed in the beginning of the next cycle, the which is at time capital L, okay? So the price is the same as the, the price that I specified for the second phase here. Again, we can see that if the customer's valuation is equal to the right one, then she's indifferent between choosing this delayed delivery option and not buying anything, okay? So the following figure uh, shows you the, the dynamics of the prices for these two different schemes, okay? So we can see that the prices have the upward trend. All right, so uh, next, uh, let me, and characterize the customer's equilibrium behaviors under this anonymous posted purchase option decisions, okay? So first we can show that as a dominant equilibrium, every customer behaves magically, which means that the customer will only be worse off if she delays to make the purchasing decision, okay? So at every customer's arrival time, then she makes the following purchase decision. So if the customer's time is in the dark gray area, then she chooses the instantaneous product delivery option. If the customer's time is in the light gray area, Light gray area, which is here, so the customer chooses the delayed delivery option. If the customer's type is in this white area, then she doesn't buy anything, okay? All right, so that having the above properties, now we are able to give a very strong managerial interpretation of our benchmark profit, okay? So now let's consider the fluid setting, which means that we wash away all uncertainties from the system. We assume customer arrival are fully deterministic, and we assume customers are easily taxable, okay? So in this setting, we can show that the profit function to sub L is essentially the seller's long-run average profit and the generator under the formation policy, and the customers exhibit the purchasing behaviors as they characterized on the previous slide, okay? All right, so by having such result, now we are able to propose and analyze the heuristic policy. Uh, so this is the policy that we are looking at. So of course, ideally we want to implement the policy we just mentioned earlier, but we cannot do so for the reason that, so the, recall that for the previous uh, policy, the seller could uh, offer customers the uh, instantaneous delivery option, but the seller can only offer this option to customers if the seller has inventory on hand, right? Therefore, it's not always the case that in our setting with stochasticity, the seller can always keep inventory on hand. So we have to make the following modifications. 
So now let's look at the first uh, cycle. So suppose at some point of time in the first phase, the seller runs out of inventory, then she should stop offering customers the instantaneous delivery option. But alternatively, the seller offers customers the delayed delivery option. And uh, if the seller runs out of inventory in the second phase of the cycle, then the seller just stops offering the, the inventory holding the, the, the instantaneous delivery option, okay? Uh, so inventory policy is almost the same as the previous one. The seller just uh, pays on war in the beginning of every cycle with the quality that is equal to the cumulative sales on the previous uh, cycle. And again, we can show that the dominant equilibrium is that every customer behaves magically. And in terms of the seller's performance, we can show that if we proportionally scale the customer arrival rate and the seller's fixed ordering cost, then in the high volume regime, our proposed policy is symptomatically optimal. So I think that's all about what I would like to talk today. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you.